Welcome, welcome to the Hive Think Tank. Hello, Data Bees. For those of you who are returning, hi, welcome back. And for those of you who are new, welcome to the Hive Think Tank. My name is Maddie Watt. I am the Senior Manager of People and Programs at the Hive. So we're gonna jump right into it because today is an incredible event and we don't wanna waste any time. Ravi, would you mind pulling up the slides for me? Thank you so much. If you guys wanna share where you're joining us from and you wanna share it in the chat, we'd love to see. We have people joining all around the world today and we're so, so grateful for this amazing panel of the top brightest minds in business. And we're gonna be talking all about what sustainability means to these leading brands and visionaries. Thank you, Ravi. So real quick, what is the Hive Think Tank? The Hive Think Tank is the Hive's ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, and thought leaders. We are an event and content platform that focuses on things related to AI, data, and leading edge technologies and digital transformation. We are so honored to have over 1,200 members. We have over 400 speakers, and we are bringing you events about every other week. And we have- 12,000 12, members. 12,000 members. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ravi. Um, and we have two amazing events coming up for you guys. We have the last one of the year next Monday, and then we have another one coming up for January. And I'm going to show you guys those slides, and I will drop you the links to them. And then we're going to jump into the session. Thank you, Ravi. So, and also a thank you to our sponsors, including Gamuda, who will be involved with one of our upcoming events. Next slide, Ravi, please. Thank you. So, the future of cities underground. This is going to be with our partner Gamuda. This will be coming up on Monday in the evening time if you are on the west coast of the United States. And this is going to be teaming up with some of the heads of the brightest minds of tunneling and autonomous tunneling. So we are building underground cities in the future and trying to deal with the ever-changing world and sustainability issues. So this kind of uh, event is going to talk all about that. And I will share the link with you for that in the chat. Ravi, next slide, please. Just one comment on this, you know, as, as uh, urbanization continues to grow over the next 50 years, we, we are running out of space in the sky. And, and think about Mexico City or New Delhi or uh, Bombay, Mumbai. Um, so so, so um, you, you should see kind of living spaces, parking spaces, transportation um, happen underground. And, and this is going to be an incredible event. Elon Musk and, and uh, Branson and so forth have been talking a lot about tunneling. These guys actually do tunneling all over the world. Exactly. Thank you, Ravi. And then lastly, we are going to be hosting insurance for the sharing economy. Insurance is rapidly changing as the way we do business is rapidly changing thanks to the gig economy. So please go ahead and look out for that link as well. I'll drop that in the chat. And I want to give the virtual mic over to TM Ravi, the managing director and founder of The Hive. Thank you, Matty. And so The Hive is a venture capital entity. Um, where we focus at the early stage, it's a venture studio model, where we, we are very actively involved with the companies in addition to investing in them. And so everything we do is driven by deep tech data and AI. And, and you see sort of some of our thematic focus and areas that, that we participate in. Um, we have the Hive um, here in the U.S. I'm sitting in, in Palo Alto. But in addition to that, we have presence in separate entities in Brazil, Southeast Asia based in Kuala Lumpur, India based in Bangalore. And I'd like to introduce my colleague, Geraldine, who is starting the Hive in Europe. Geraldine? Thank you very much, Ravi. Yes, indeed, we are starting the Hive in Europe now. And uh, so this is a plan for the next year, 2022. And it's very interesting indeed to, uh, to have this session today about sustainability because the Hive Europe is in also especially focusing on sustainability. The goal is to further exploit AI and data to address sustainability challenges, to uh, look at how to use digital to reduce carbon footprint, to engage into circularity model, uh, and to indeed develop new business around uh, this, those sustainability challenges. 
Um, we have a huge uh, entrepreneurs network here in Europe, very active on this topic, uh, looking to uh, further expand and, and grow. So that's why it's a great opportunity to have the, the IB in Europe. And also, as you know, Europe is quite active with the Green Deal strategy of the European Commission, and also some support from different funds, very active in impact investment. But the goal is to go beyond the, the buzzword and really to develop new business that will make sustainability very active and, and a, a great opportunity for all. So that's why I'm very interested to get the feedback of and the insight of our speaker today. Uh, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot and uh, looking forward to the Q&A session, always very interesting in the IVA think talk. We, we have an amazing discussion today and I don't want to be overly dramatic and saying that sustainability is the most uh, uh, sustainability and, and climate change is the most important uh, thing in, in our lives right now. But, but the waves of uh, new younger generation, you know, Gen Z, the people who are younger than Gen Z coming, come with their minds wired very differently. And, and that's, it's, it's a revolution happening. And, and I couldn't think of anyone better than my good friend, Eric Gervais, who, who knows all things retail, consumer brands, uh, and sustainability to, to lead this conversation. So please do post your questions in the Q&A button. And, and in the course of the conversation, Eric will, will, will pick up some of your questions and, and help address them. Uh, Eric? Thank you, Ravi. So it's very exciting to welcome two great leaders of uh, iconic brands. So Guillaume Lecamp, who's leading Nespresso globally, and Guillaume Jardin, who's leading uh, HP Supplies globally as well. So uh, it's a fun conversation to have two Guillaumes. So to make the conversation easy and practical, I would suggest that I would call you GC and GG. Uh, and that will sound like very Gen Z, I guess. So. So I, I may start with a broad question uh, on, on what makes you think. So what does sustainability mean to you? Why is it so important to you personally, not just for the company, but for you as well? GC, would you like to start? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Great pleasure to, to be with you tonight. Uh, so yeah, coming back to your question, Eric, wh why is it so important? I, I, I don't think I can split the personal perspective and the, the professional. It, it goes together. The good news is that it gives sense and purpose to a, a professional life. So uh, perfect timing. Now, if I talk about my own journey into sustainability, I joined Nespresso about 13, 14 years ago. Um, and it's been a journey. It's been an evolution. I mean... Um, I joined Nespresso with this idea of corporate social responsibility. I had in mind that any brand, any corporation had a role to play, had a contribution to have, had to be a good citizen, right? And that was my starting point. And I joined Nespresso and I realized that was something probably different, at least for us in this, in this company. It was years ago, a business requirement. Uh, why is that? Because by not embracing sustainability in our value chain, not making coffee farmers sustainable, while growing a business, we had zero chance whatsoever to stay successful in business. So it was absolute necessity to say, let's work across the value chain. Let's make all our partners sustainable. That's the best way to secure our brand promise and stay successful. That was my step two. But there is a step three, and that's, I would say, the step three I'm in now. Year after year, these last 10 years, I've seen every day that sustainability was a unique opportunity to drive business uh, by many aspects. It's an opportunity to drive innovation. Many of our coffees, for those who are an espresso customers, many of the coffees that you can enjoy, the new coffees coming in, would not exist would not exist without a long-term commitment to farmers. There is a risk in growing coffee, right? There is a risk in innovating in coffee. So if you don't have this long-term partnership with each and every farmer, this innovation cannot exist. So innovation has been an amazing opportunity. Premiumization, 
the highest valued coffee in the ranch come from sustainability, right? So there is also a combination of engaging on sustainability by creating value through premiumization. Unique opportunity to engage with employees and, and more and more. I would say 10 years ago, it was probably not the case, but now, you know, there is none, not a new hire or someone, a candidate coming for an interview who, who didn't read all the web pages and all what we do in sustainability. Not, not, not only to say that employees here are asking and are, uh, you know, expecting the company to, to engage and it creates such a good you know, internal dynamic. And last opportunity, you know, it's been years we've been working with many different partners, nonprofits, public, private, whatever. Uh, the network and the amount of expertise and skills you can access when you uh, enjoy, you know, engage in sustainability is, is, is insane. Last example, we, we joined the, the uh, Vice President Harris uh, efforts in the uh, Northern Triangle together with Microsoft, MasterCard, all these great brands, but different backgrounds. It's unbelievable the amount of know-how and expertise you can access through that. So I think the demonstration is there, uh, but long story short, I started like, well, that's a duty. And I leave sustainability now as a unique day-to-day -day opportunity. Thank you, Guillaume. Gigi, what's your take on this? What makes you think? Well, I, I will start by saying that uh, I'm a father of three young girls. And probably the only thing they understand of my job is uh, what I do on sustainability. So actually, if I want to be a little bit regarded by my daughter, in inspi inspiring them, they like to hear my stories about sustainability. And there's one of them that I can throw uh, just immediately about the work we've been doing in Haiti to collect plastic bottles so that we can upcycle them into, um, into new products, cartridges, uh, a lot of them, uh, combined plastic bottles coming from the ocean and with other materials in order to produce new cartridges. And when, when I tell them, we just invested into a new line in order to double the capacity of doing that with local communities. They are, they are a little bit proud of their father and they understand a little bit more why I'm doing, I'm spending so much time in this little office. Um, and and uh, goes very well. The other thing, I, obviously, I, I think a little bit like GC is uh, uh, in, our, in our career, we've been a, a little bit evolving into, oh, this is, one of the elements of a scorecard. We need to make sure that we do the right thing for the society. And HP has been, uh, to me, uh, uh, big in, in terms of value, in terms of focus on the betterment of a society. So sustainability has always been big within the company. But like GC, I uh, like what he said, uh, um, it's, it's become a business imperative for print supplies and for HP in general. And we are now also trying to make it a competitive advantage. I, let's be very authentic about this. I'm a business leader. I, uh, I, I need to run a business. And now what, what I see is that we can actually make business sense of driving a, a more sustainable world. And it's, uh, so that's the beauty of it. And I think we are in this mode. And that's why also we see so many companies uh, joining because, because they see that there is actually an opportunity to make business sense out of it. It's not just uh, something that we have to do, it's something that we need to do, and it's something that makes sense. And so as a, as a business, what I'm focused on is uh, three plus one pillars, I like to call them. One is combating deforestation. I mean, printing, paper, so this perception is not really good. But in fact, we make sure that all the paper that is being, all the HP paper that is being used to print is actually uh, offset by planting trees. So we, we actually uh, do zero deforestation on all our HP paper and packaging. And that's important to us. And just a few weeks ago, we signed another partnership with WWF for $80 million in order to make sure that any paper used on our HP printer will be uh, offset from a deforestation standpoint. So we are very proud of that. It's a big investment, but we think it's the right thing to do. The other one is on 
uh, carbon neutrality and, and circularity. HP has made a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2040. My own business will start by being carbon neutral by 2030. And Eric, we've been talking about this and it's a, it's a massive transformation. And in order to do that, we are really propelling the engine of circularity and working across the three apps, reduce, re recycle and reuse uh, in order to make this happen. And it's, a, it's actually a, a very interesting journey for us uh, because you can, you can really build on the technology, the innovation engine within the company to actually uh, make an impact on those uh, free elements and the circularity and really redesign the business and re-architect around uh, that goal um, and make a, make a better business at the end of the day. Uh, so so the, the plus one that I would mention is the local communities. Uh, uh, GC was talking about the local farmers the work that we do in Haiti is actually helping uh, uh, build more than 2,000 jobs locally uh, in Haiti to collect these plastic bottles from the ocean. We have partnership around the globe. We have a program called HP Planet Partners that allows us to recycle in more than 65 countries around the globe. We do that with, uh, with local partnerships. That's absolutely essential for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gigi. Can, can you tell us a bit more, Gigi, on, on the toughest challenges that you've been confronted to, the, the hard part? Uh, so it's a great question. Yeah, and um, I think the first one I would mention is uh, how we can balance short and long-term goals. Uh, it's a lot of these things, a lot of these changes require investment in the short term uh, that will pay off in the long run. And so, very focused on the long game, but at the same time, we need to find trade-offs and ways to make things happen in the short term. Uh, so creating that balance and making the right choices uh, uh, to, uh, in terms of investment um, is, is, is a difficulty, is a challenge, but it's, it's part of the work that I, I'm, I'm doing every day now. Is, uh, is I know the goal for 2030, we need to be carbon neutral. These are the things that we need to do along the way. And how do I create capacity in order to make this happen? Uh, the, the, second, the second thing is uh, making sure that we can strengthen and build a partnership. Um, um, it, it's it, to, to really create, re-architect the business into uh, a sustainable business that causes no harm to the planet. You need an enter, entire ecosystem behind you. And, and, and so I was mentioning the planet partners, but local communities, our channel partners, our customers. We need to incent customers to do the right thing, to recycle with us, to return their cartridges, uh, for instance. And so we need to make it easier. So creating this uh, engagement experience partnership um, and improving them along the way is uh, super important. And then in terms of talk about challenges, I think one of them is sometimes, I mean, the regulatory environment. Um, is, uh, I mean, we are faced with different regulations in different countries and they are ever changes, cha changing. And sometimes they are just politically driven, dogmatically driven, and not necessarily um, um, thinking about what's the right thing to do over the long term. So I would advocate, and we are trying to advocate for a hey, dear policymakers, work with us, we can, we, can, we can maybe work better solutions uh, for the long term. If you, if you take into account some of the constraints we have in each industry, uh, GC's industry is different than mine. And, and the way you approach sustainability is going to be different in his industry versus mine. And, um, and so I think it's important that when we, when we have policymakers uh, trying to enforce, and it's, it's required to have regulation also to, uh, to make sure that we have a fair practices in, uh, in the economy, they also work with us um, as industry leaders so that we can create the better, better solutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Guillaume. GC, what's your take of, say, the, 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 the big battles, the big challenges you've been tackling in the past few years and, and what's ahead of you now? Yeah, that, that's, well, first of all, as a principal, Eric, this is a world of challenges. 
And, and I can tell you, the more you move forward, the more humble you are on this topic. Because as a principle, uh, what I've seen, every time you address a challenge, you have two new challenges showing up uh, immediately. So it's, it's, it's a journey. Uh, maybe sharing some examples of what, what we faced in the past and, and likely addressed and what's, what's on the table now, what's coming. Uh, just one example, it probably resonating was uh, uh, Guillaume was saying, partnership. I think we probably forgot that 15 years ago, it was a nonsense to work with, or at least nonsense, a challenge to work with nonprofits. They had opposite objectives. You know, I remember years ago asking myself, shall we put all these nonprofits in the same room with us? They want to kill us. They don't want to work with us. It, it, was, it was quite an interesting time. I can tell you from my perspective, my experience, it's behind us. It's all about partnership. Everybody agreed that there is no way to succeed not working together. And we made such progress on this. And it's, it's, really, it's really amazing what where, the level of partnership we achieve with so many nonprofits, fantastic. So I want to believe that this being addressed, it's an opportunity now. The second one, and it would also uh, echo what Guillaume was saying on customer engagement, that's probably a hot topic for Nespresso. I remember joining Nespresso and you know, discovering all the amazing stories that we had with uh, farmers and what we do in the coffee farms, in the coffee uh, countries, trying to explain the stories and no license to tell because the capsules topic was coming in the discussion immediately. Uh, the challenge is that it's very, it, it's getting very emotional very quickly. And it's, it's really difficult to bring the rational and the facts um, on, on the, so probably for the audience here, and I'm happy to give you the facts. I would surprise many people here saying that a portion coffee system is by many aspects, much more efficient from a CO2 standpoint than a filter coffee solution. Not super intuitive, but that's the facts. Now, to explain, to communicate, and to engage with customers on such a topic is a daily challenge. You can, you can communicate, but as long as you don't address the emotions, it's very difficult to convey your message. How many times I've heard, you don't communicate? And my answer, yes, we do, but we're not, we're not audible, we're not heard. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, if we're not heard, and if we talk about capsules and circularity and recycling, exactly as Guillaume, you know, we cannot address the circularity aspect without a partnership with customers. Uh, we need to explain, we need to, so it's a, it's a, it's a daily conversation, um, but uh, I think we made progress, but we're not there yet. Now, what's next for us? My obsession, my, my, what keeps me awake is, you know, we committed to carbon neutrality, and, and Guillaume, no competition here, but we committed for 2022 and will be carbon neutral by 2022. We see that as a milestone, it's not the end game. The end game for all of us should be net zero. Uh, but we know that moving from carbon neutrality to net zero for us will be to transition more than 100,000 farmers from conventional agriculture to regenerative ag. And it will require education, training, innovation, because farmers are, you know, they are smart. They will not follow this path if we don't provide them the technical solution to maintain their yield, to maintain their revenue. That's my next um, exciting challenge, because if we manage to do that, I think we will go a long way. So again, um, many challenges, but so many opportunities when you, when you manage to address them. And the first example I shared with nonprofit, uh, it's been a, a long journey, but where we are now makes me optimistic for the, the other challenges. Mm -hmm. To make it even more interesting and, and salty, I mean, to get to the, the, the provocation, can you share some examples of things that you tried that did not work? Let me see. I, I, what did not, not work, I, I would take some examples of, of some challenges. Maybe my, my first, and I, I'm happy to find examples because we, we, we obviously we failed sometimes, but before failing, um, 
when you have a new program, a new service for farmers, like you know, implementing a pension fund for Colombian farmers, right? That that's that you know that triggers a lot of pride because these farmers are aging, uh, but they don't have any way to retire, which creates a lot of problems of you know sustainability of coffee farming. Um, no opportunity for the kids to hand over on the farm. And obviously for the farmers, they should have uh, the possibility to retire. So you create a pension farm that works and it's existing now in Colombia. My frustration, I don't know if it's failing or not, but it's quite similar, is not to be able to scale fast enough. And to say, now we have to provide this service for half a million farmers. and. And then, then you, you face the challenges of, you know, who will invest what and how do we finance that? And, and to be honest, we didn't crack the code to scale it where it should be scaled. That's one example that comes uh, top of my mind. And obviously, uh, recycling. I would say I long, as long as we don't reach 100%, which is purely theoretical, because we know that 100% recycling will be difficult but as long as we don't reach 100% of recycling capsules, that's a failure in a way, right? Even if I can be quite happy to increase the recycling rate of our capsules every day, every year, we did uh, great in the US over the last couple of years. So in a way, positive results, but on principle, mm -hmm. as long as we don't have 100% circularity of packaging, I would like to say it's a failure to continue to keep pushing and take the challenge. Mm -hmm. And if I have other examples later on, I'm happy to come back. Thank you. Gigi, any, any learning from like the, the, the really tough part, I mean, the things that, that you're struggling with? Well, I, I, would, I, would, um, I would mention the fact that, um, I mean, we, sometimes we believe from a, as an outsider that oh you just you just recycle you just reuse and it's 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 not that complicated I, I, uh, it is complicated and one thing that makes it extremely complicated is that there shouldn't be any compromise on the quality the customers are, are, are not willing to compromise on the quality of their experience and so it requires a lot of innovation and 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 sometimes, I mean, really developing specific technology to be able to recycle, reuse, combine all of this, reduce uh, the energy consumption of products, uh, while making sure it's 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 uh, it's high quality. Uh, because at the end, that's what customers uh, want from us. Uh, they want they want they want both. They don't want compromise. Uh, they they want the sustainability, but they want the quality as well. So making sure that along the way we can. We can transform the business. We can make it more sustainable without impacting ne negatively uh, the quality and uh, the cost uh, of uh, operating. It's, 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 it's actually it's not an easy undertaking. It's a, it's a, it, and that's what people should realize. And sometimes it's even a frustration of my side with some of my engineers. It doesn't move enough fast, but. Then I, I go through the details. Yeah, I, but at the same time, I don't want you to compromise on quality. And, and it's, uh, so it takes time, it takes testing, it takes uh, engineering, it uh, takes creativity. At the same time, you can turn that challenge into an inspiration. And, and that's, that's a great thing because you challenge your teams in order to think differently about, techno about technology, their innovation, in order to solve that problem. But it's a, it's a, it, a, it is it is not something to be uh, 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 to be uh, to be ignored. Mm -hmm. Can we maybe Gigi go one step into the uh, how you mobilize the organization? How, how you make sure so that it's part of everyone's job and not just an agenda item from time to time? Well, I actually I, I uh, it was a. I guess it, it will have been a question very difficult to answer a year ago for me. Mm -hmm. uh, really on that structure, I, how do I mobilize people to do that? Uh, and a little bit like GC was saying, I mean, people, when they come to the company, new people, they, they, they want to hear about what we are doing on sustainability. 
So they are, they are curious, they are interested. But if I look at the large pool of my organization and even outside of an organization from a company standpoint, uh, it has become actually something that uh, is creating a source of inspiration for the team. So when, when I announced, okay, we're gonna be carbon neutral, and it's gonna be in the next eight years, the, the organization was thrilled about that. Okay, how can we make this happen? We need to still achieve business goals. How can we make this business carbon neutral and truly carbon neutral by reducing significantly carbon emission? And, and actually, I, in the past, I would have said, okay, uh, to some engineers on my manufacturing teams or my supply chain team, you need to reduce cost. Now I tell them, reduce carbon emissions. And you know the funny thing is that when I tell them reduce carbon emission, they, they know that they cannot increase cost. So they are reducing cost as well. So I don't need to tell them reduce cost anymore. They reduce carbon emission and they will reduce cost. They will do both. And that's what is happening. It's actually very inspiring. And I have the same with the R&D engineers. I say, we need to design the products differently so that we can reduce carbon emission. And but they know we cannot compromise on quality. They know that we cannot increase costs, uh, which, uh, which we cannot pass through. So what they are doing are using the engineering capability, the technology in order to make this happen. And they are inspired by the challenge of reducing carbon emission. So in fact, it's become easier when you're clear about the vision, what you have for the business, why it makes sense, it fits the values of a company in terms of betterment of the society. And everybody wants to contribute to that. In fact, I mean, I haven't seen anyone saying, well, no, it's not a good idea. Yes, it's great. We want to be part of it. And so when you make it very clear that it's, your, it's, your, it's a superior objective and you mean it, then your teams are just riding with it. And they do this plus the rest. So that's, that's actually... Uh, I, it, it, it is very inspiring to me. I mean, of course, I'm saying it in a, in a very summarized way. Every day, you need to make sure everybody understands what needs to be done, how we can do things differently. But if you have that North Star, very clear, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually, you can mobilize with sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier that HP is investing a lot in, uh, uh, in, uh, in compensating for the, the, the implication of uh, having people use a lot of paper, mm -hmm. is it something that's audible to the end consumer? Like to, to, to what extent can the customers connect the dots between, oh, I need to print, and at the same time, I, I, I understand I do it in a way that is made sustainable by the brand that, that, that works for me. Is it something that people you feel are um, are we willing to understand or is it still a challenge? It's, it's, it's a big challenge. I should have added it to the list of challenges when you mentioned it to me. Um, we, there's this perception, inevitably you've got a paper and, and okay, uh, people associate with a tree. But in fact, first of all, a, a tree is a, is, is, is a renewable uh, material. And you can plant trees. I mean, it's uh, a lot of materials that you cannot renew. Trees, you can. Uh, you, uh, we are making houses with wood. Where does it come from? From trees. Um, and, and nobody has a problem with that. And I actually think it's better than building houses with concrete. Uh, so, so, but yes, when it comes to printing, it's still a, a challenge. That's why we invest so much into this. We believe in it. We are actually proud of what we are doing. Um, there is a power with print that we see with kids, with a lot of people performing better with print, uh, kids learning better when they print stuff. So it's important. And what we are trying to make sure of is that you should not worry about the impact of, uh, of print uh, with HP. And you should not worry about the forest. You should not worry. We're trying to help on the ocean, like I explained with this investment in Haiti. And we are trying also to make it better from a plastic recycling standpoint. So we understand all those concerns. But yes, I mean, this perception of an association is difficult to fight. But it's upon us to make sure that people understand what we are doing and, and, and why it's good. And, 
um, this big partnership with WWF is helping a lot huh? because then this NGO is actually speaking on our behalf of about the things that we are doing to uh, replant uh, trees and, uh, and protect forests all across the globe. And we do this in, then in California, um, in the US. So it's not just uh, in some remote places, it's actually also in our neighborhoods in a number of places. And we will continue to do that. It's a, it's a commitment on our side. Thank you, Guillaume. GC, I'd like to double click on an item you mentioned earlier about the opportunity to premiumize with, with sustainability. So the, the link between sustainability and quality and the willingness to pay, could, could you elaborate on, on how this works as a learning for others? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna talk about obviously Nespresso and not pretending that you know what I'm saying is relevant for everybody, but um, I think it starts with the, the value proposition of, of this brand, which is really an experience that is, in a way, decommoditizing one of the biggest commodity on earth, that is coffee. Um, but it, it, it starts with a, a great product, you know, that, that's the starting point. You have to access the best material, the best coffee beans, the best, I would say, taste profile, because actually we don't buy coffee beans, we buy a taste. Uh, a signature. And that's why we need to work with a specific farmer who is the farmer who will deliver the taste on the, on the long run. So it's all connected, right? So you have access to the best product, the best uh, coffee beans. And once you have that, people want to know the story and you have to explain and, and deliver the full experience that goes far beyond a coffee bean or a coffee cup. People want to hear about the farmer who's behind that. They want to understand what was the process, the, 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 the background, uh, how is it possible to achieve such a, a test profile? So when you, when you, you, know, you, you put all of that together, um, I think this is the, this is the driver of premiumization. I, you know, I have so many stories. I had a chance to travel a lot in uh, coffee farms and in, you know, coffee countries. Every time I spent, you know, a great moment with a farmer, a family. I just want to share that with the world because I know that everybody wants to have this kind of experience and this connection to uh, the farmers' community. Uh, I could tell you so many stories. The last one, probably the the most memorable for me in Congo, where, you know, you go on, on a Lake Kivu, you end up on an island, you meet with uh, this woman growing coffee for 40, 50 years. There is no electricity on this island. She has never tried coffee. She doesn't know how it tastes. And you're there, you connect with this woman, and you create this moment of sharing and, and, and just having these kind of stories and you bring that to your customers, uh, for me is a premiumization driver. The relational part of the brand experience becomes more and more important. And I would even say in this COVID or pandemic context where everything changed in a way, this human connection, I think will be even more important from a, from a a value proposition standpoint. This is far beyond a product. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I see we're starting to get some really good questions from the audience, uh, from, from Kartik, for example. Well, one of them is, uh, well, bridges with, with what you just said, the beyond the product. To what extent do you see that as a, a key, uh, as a driving force to transform the organization itself? I mean, to, to, to develop new capabilities, to organize differently. Do you have examples of, of uh, either things that work or challenges that have to do with transformation beyond the product itself? It could affect the distribution channels, the way we do marketing, uh, supply, yeah. the, the, the procurement function too. Maybe two, two, two examples from the inside and the outside perspective. Um, from the inside, and I, I might repeat what Guillaume was saying, I think compared to 10 years ago, when you, have, you had to explain why 
business and sustainability could work together. Well, it was not a given for everybody that this was the future. You know, I remember people say, well, that's, that's not luxury. Well, I think sustainability is a pure luxury, uh, you know, connecting with your value chain is the, is the essence of luxury, right? So, but 10 years ago, not obvious question to challenge. Today, it's, it's, it's even, you know, you have to feed uh, people in the organization. You have to tell them more. You have to train them more. Uh, they're asking much more, but no one is asking why we should do that. I think everybody understood, at least uh, in, in our organization, that that's the only way to succeed in business. So once everybody understand that if you don't go that way, you have no chance to, to succeed, you might even be out of business. Uh, it, it becomes quite obvious, right? Now, from the outside perspective, one trend that I believe is, is key is that this is a topic where customers don't want to be told. They don't want to get stories of brands, oh, I'm more green and I'm better. They don't want that. Uh, and that's why probably we are not heard or audible from a communication standpoint, because the one-way street communication cannot work, right? Um, I believe in the, so the buzzword would be conversational or whatever. Now, I think it's about engagement. I think you have, if we want to succeed, and that's what we are working on now, you have, and we have to bring customers at the core of the action. We have to make customers acting to, you know, together with the brand. We have to give them access to their own impact, right? Because they, we all face um, much bigger issues than ourselves. You know, global warming, what can I do as a, I can reduce a little bit, but it's much bigger than me. Now, if I partner with a brand, I can amplify, I can maximize my contribution, I might stay with this brand because the brand gives me access to my own, you know, purpose. Um, but I don't think it's about communication. I don't think it's about uh, well, storytelling. Uh, okay, story proving is probably uh, more efficient. Mm -hmm. But but it's all about doing and and moving forward together with your customers and make them feel proud about what they do with the brand. Thank you. DJ, what's your take on the broader end-to-end -end transformation play beyond the product itself? I will, I will take a couple of examples. One is, uh, um, I've been, uh, in the past, we've been asking the supply chain to, and manufacturing to uh, centralize in order to minimize costs, do it out of Asia, and then dispatch the products all across the block. Uh, about a year ago, I started to have them, we need to be able to um, reuse more products, more of our materials and products. When we return to our cartridges, how can we, how can we be able to reuse the materials? And in order to do that, the only way to make it cost efficient is actually to be able to make a fully uh, circular process locally. Uh, so, it's been a head scratcher at the beginning of a manufacturing organization, supply chain organization was looking at me, uh, are you sure? I, I mean, kind of uh, almost like, uh, uh, are you saying? And, and then for the conversation, they realized, yeah, there is an opportunity to do it differently. We will not have to ship materials back, all these cartridges to be returned to Asia, uh, uh, scrap them, recycle them, upcycle them into new products add more new virgin plastic in order to come up with a new cartridge and then ship it back to the market in Europe or in the US. Uh, instead, if we return a cartridge, can we, if it's a proper quality, can we reuse it? Or can we, uh, can we uh, recycle it, but locally? So removing all those logistics in between. Can we make it cost effective? 
So that's what we've been launching as a uh, they've been launching as a pilot in Germany about a year ago uh, to do that to test that and again with the same quality. So it's it's been a big transformation change. For years we've been told centralize, make it in low cost countries. Now we need to balance it out much more so that we can uh, we can be uh, uh, more sustainable as a business, but also in fact create a better experience for our customers because I will. Uh, I will incentivize our customers in Germany in this pilot to be part of it and help us return more so that we can make this work. And, um, and I think that's a, that's a fascinating, we've been in this for six months, nine months into that specific initiative. And it's been a, it's been a, great, um, uh, a great experience so far. So we look forward to the final few months in order to decide whether or not we will scale it. The second example is actually, the business has been very transactional. As many products we can ship, customers want new cartridge, we ship a new cartridge, and, uh, and then we figure out how, what to do with it to minimize waste at the end. We are moving to services. And as we move to services, we create a different engagement with a customer, and we make recycling part of it. So we make recycling easy. There is a recycling bag that goes with uh, the, ship, the shipment of cartridges in a program that we call Instanic. I mean, a little bit what, the same as what GC is doing with Nespresso, there is a recycling bag. We make it for free. It's very, so as we move to services, create a different engagement with customer. We are also transforming the way we do recycling and we facilitate that process for customers. And that's a, another way of thinking that our category teams, our product development teams, or service development teams, and customer engagement teams are, are working on to really transform so that uh, it becomes more natural and easy for our customers to, uh, uh, to recycle with us. Great, thank you. We, we talked about the ecosystem and not to make a double click on, on the supplier side. So we talked about the farmers for Nespresso. In the case of HP supplies, uh, what is it that is uh, particularly important vis-a-vis -vis suppliers? Maybe for packaging, for recycling? Uh... Yeah, for for uh, uh, well, in a lot of uh, in a lot of areas. I mean, first, I mean, if you think about paper, we work with uh, uh, paper mill companies to make sure that uh, uh, the, this forest uh, positive commitment is fulfilled, and so we work with them, with both suppliers, to make sure that. The paper that is being produced, uh, uh, HP branded, will be uh, meeting these FSC requirements. Um, so that's one element. The other one, I mean, every supplier that we have in our supply chain and manufacturing is to meet uh, sustainability uh, criteria, more and more stringent, and participating to this overall uh, ambitious goal that we have for the company. Then when it comes to channel, channel partners, uh, we, we work a lot with distributors in supplies business is more than 14,000 distributors, resellers across the globe. They are, they are part of a program called, called Amplify where we have a sustainability uh, goal with them. And they are actually uh, in, in, in all these countries are agents to facilitate the recycling process with us. And so uh, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's part of that ecosystem that I was mentioning. And then we have NGOs, like in the case of uh, Haiti, we work with Laverne, Free Mile Island, which is an NGO in order to, to, to create that, uh, that process of collecting uh, plastic bottles from the ocean and, and, and uh, upcycling them. So it's a variety of things. It's our core suppliers for the products itself. It's our, it's our uh, manufacturing partner. It's our logistic partner. It's also our channel partner, very important in that process. And then some NGOs, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see a question from the audience uh, that may tap into your experience into recycling. So at early stage, uh, brands that have not done as much as you've done already uh, to recycle, they have a challenge to reach critical mass for the recycling process to work. Uh, what's your experience or lessons learned to get to that level where you get critical mass? Is that just like a sheer investment or uh, how did you cope with the acceleration to get to a point that is was really worth it and move from uh, say a first step where it's marginal to where you are today, which is really meaningful? 
the question to me, uh, Eric. Uh, no, Rick Bonner, this, okay, I'll start with that. Um, yes. So, so on my, I, yes, I mean, we've got the advantage of scale. And so that's a massive advantage. Uh, it's, uh, um, uh, so that's why I think we can, yeah, we can, we can lead the way and we should be leading the way as uh, big brands uh, and big companies with the scale that we have to actually show how this can be done. So I understand for smaller companies, it's a much more difficult process, and and uh, because there are costs involved. I mean, it's not a, it's not, it's not cost neutral to do all of this and uh, to think about your business in a complete circular way. Uh, so we have the advantage of scale. GC has it with Nespresso, I have it with HP, uh, and that that allows us to to think about um, uh, some innovations in a, a with a cost efficiency that it requires. Uh, we test a lot, and we can test. Uh, with enough scale so that we understand how uh, we can ramp up uh, new processes. Uh, this thing that I was explaining in Germany uh, is tested with some customers and it's in, but it's enough of a scale. We've got only actually 300 or 400 customers signing up, but it's enough for us as a scale to be able to, to then uh, determine that we can uh, uh, we make, we can make a circular process. We can re re uh, uh, assess the cartridges return for reuse or recycling. And then we can make it uh, a cost efficient. And then we can uh, uh, ensure the quality is there. Once we have done all of this, then we can assume, well, we start scaling this. And that's what will happen next. So um, yeah, lots of experiments as well that we can do in different countries. Uh, uh, just mentioned one of them, but there are a few others that we have in play right now. And of course, we use that power of scale in order to be able to do uh, many things at the same time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you see on your end any lessons learned on scaling recycling, the economics of recycling? Yeah, happy to share that. From a customer standpoint, uh, two drivers, uh, awareness and convenience, period. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all what drive the recycling uh, system. And for us, I would say three steps and time, timed in, uh, in, in, uh, in three steps. One, standalone system. You cannot wait to have everything in place. So you put in place your own system. It costs a lot, but you have to start with yourself and put uh, uh, possibilities uh, on the table uh, that you will implement by yourself. Example, the UPS bag in... Uh, in, in the US, it's a standalone system. You send back your capsule through UPS to a recycling facility. We take care of everything. It costs a lot. And you don't have the full scale as long as you don't move to step two, which is collective system. But here you need investment. You need to convince. For those who live in New York, you put now your capsules in the blue bin. It will be sought out because we finance the equipment in the uh, uh, recycling facility. And that you have a, a, a second step where you can really scale more, uh, bringing more convenience, but more possibilities. Step three, and we are in this step three in many countries in Europe, is pre-competitive. Once you implemented the, the systems, you open to competition. Uh, we have that in France, we have that in the UK, we have it in Switzerland, where we say to competition, please work together, because uh, this is how we're going to even scale and, and massify the good news, I would say, the cherry on the cake when you have this uh, collective system in place is that you become an enabler of something bigger than you as a brand. When we implemented any current machine in a, in a recycling center, not only you recover the aluminum capsules, but all the non-ferrous component that used to be landfilled suddenly come out. So the ratio or the amplification is, is, is huge. So not only you fix or you serve your customers, but you fix a much bigger problem, which is for me the ultimate goal of scale, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. We're getting close to the end. I'd like to close with a word of advice from each of you. So we start with GC. We have in the room plenty of uh, young emerging leaders uh, who are eager to learn, who may be early in their job or, or, or entrepreneurs. 
What would you say as an advice to them to tackle this challenge and opportunity? So I start? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I would, I would say, you know, I, I like paradoxes, so I'm going to try to articulate one here. I would say something like, be patient in, in acting fast. What do I mean? And let's elaborate a little bit here. Be patient because it takes time. You know, we started recycling in Switzerland 30 years ago. We rolled out the system about 12, 13 years ago in uh, the rest of the world. And we are not there yet. You know, it, it takes time. Um, so even planting a coffee tree, you will not get coffee beans next, next week, right? Everything takes time, right? So you have to be patient and resilient. But we have to act fast. Why? Because it takes time. So every day counts now if we want to have the impact as soon as possible. And also because, you know, I, I've been in this journey, you know, hearing a lot of discussion, a lot of discussions. And, and I love discussions. But 10 years ago, we were wondering if carbon was a real issue. Uh, seven years ago, we said, well, maybe, you know, the trees are not the solution. It's, uh, is it worth the investment? Now we know that, that it's, it's a, a potential solution. So now, well, guess what? We say, well, but a tree might, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep carbon for 20 years only, but not more. So you will have always people say, yeah, but maybe not the solution. Or carbon neutrality. Yeah, but it's not reduction. Carbon offsetting, yes, no. We can debate forever. And all these questions are valid. I'm not pushing back. But let's address this long-term question by acting now on what we can act. That, that's all what I, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guillaume. Did you? Uh, it's it's uh, difficult to add to what GC said, actually. <laughs> it's, it's a great summary. But I would say, I, I think, um, I mean, it's important to think about the long game. Um, and to focus on doing the right thing. Uh, authentically, not just talking, shouting, and uh, setting long, uh, goals in the long run. People have been educated and they understand uh, the corporate, corporate uh, uh, verbiage and, and they trust actions. And they, that's, that's what matters at the end. And, and I, I agree with GC in the fact, yes, we need to act fast. We need to show these actions, but also we need to understand that this transformation take time. It's not because of unwillingness to move fast. It's because they take time. They take time when you are trying to do sustainability without compromising quality and experience and the experience of a customer. It's, it's tough. It's a big challenge. But, but I think if you are a business leader and, and in, the, in this audience, my recommendation is really to think about the long game, think differently, design your business for sustainability truly. And, and, and you will see many opportunities along the way to actually use innovation technology to do things differently. And that's fascinating. And that's a, it's a momentum you create with yourself, with your organization. And I've been through that journey, I'm still there. I'm discovering new ways of doing things differently. And it's fascinating. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Thanks a lot to both Eric, of you. Eric, Eric. Can I, can I end up with a little quote? Yes, uh, go ahead. A joke? <laughs> you know what's the difference between talking and, and, and doing? You don't know? It's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, so my, my big takeaway here is that it's a journey. What, what I hear from both of you. And, and it's easy to sort of be um, kind of uh, ideological about uh, sustainability. But if you want real uh, uh, change, then it's a, it's a journey and you need to kind of really bring people with you. So I, I really thank you, Eric, first for helping put this panel together and for moderating it. And, and both uh, Guillaume from Nespresso and, and Guillaume from HP Inc. For, for your participation. We look forward to your continued participation uh, in, in these kind of important discussions around sustainability and, and global climate change, and hope you'll come and visit us in Silicon Valley sometime. So thank you all.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers and thanks to our Thank panel you. attendees. Bye, guys. Have a great rest Bye. of your day. Bye. Thank you.